Good evening. Welcome to the 2022 Fall Show Virtual Lecture. My name is Tim Johnson. I'm the director of the Botanic Garden of Smith College. Live transcription has been enabled for this webinar. Attendees can turn this feature on and off through the live transcription icon at the bottom of the Zoom webinar screen. Tonight's speaker has generously agreed to answer any questions we do not get to during this webinar on our social media platforms and through our e-newsletter. We request that you wait until the presentation is complete before submitting questions through the Q&A feature. A reminder that all available pre-registration time slots for visiting this year's Bulb Show in person are now full. For the duration of the Bulb Show from March 7th through the 18th, only people who have pre-registered or who are in the Smith College testing protocol will be permitted to enter our building. If you were unable to secure a time slot, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and sign up for our e-newsletter Digitalis on our website garden.smith.edu to witness the show unfolding virtually. I'm having a slight hiccup, so I'm gonna try to share my screen one more time and see if I can advance it. We will resume normal business hours Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on March 21st. At that time, visitors can access our conservatory and our current exhibit in the church exhibition gallery, Horticultural Heroes, which was developed by our friends at Tower Hill Botanic Garden. Please see our website for details on visiting and note that masks are still required to access Smith College buildings. Even as we come together tonight in celebration, the world and the Smith College community is not without strife and heartache today. Wherever you are, whatever you are navigating, thank you for bringing as much of yourself here as you are able to at this time. And if you are able, I encourage you to reach out to a loved one. I'm ever grateful to navigate new challenges and obstacles with an inspiring team alongside amazing colleagues and for an exceptional community. Our collective work is among the most noble of pursuits pursuit of understanding. Every day here offers a chance to learn, to discover, to explore, to play, and to be grateful for the way a love of plants and a life rich with fellow plant lovers brings joy and creates meaning in our lives. Work on this year's Bulb Show was already underway 12 months ago as our staff dismantled last year's show. Similarly, we have already begun planning for next year's show. It takes a village and commitment to bring the bulb show and tonight's event to life, and I want to thank a few people. Thank you to the friends of the Botanic Garden of Smith College, the new members, the members we are welcoming back, like, well, friends and those who've stuck with us throughout the pandemic. Your appreciation makes our work possible. For those of you who are not yet members, you can join today for as little as $50 a year, and you too can count yourself among the many who support our opening lectures, paid student opportunities, innovative botanical exhibits, and free admission. Thank you to our show producer, Lily Caron. We literally could not have done it without you. And to our production assistants, Sasha Zeidenberg, class of 22, O Gold, class of 25, Emma Friedman, class of 24, and Abigail Dustin, class of 23, as well as horticulturalist Dan Babno. Thank you also to all the students who assisted us with our community potting up party last fall, making short work out of planting a few thousand bulbs. This year's show also features laser cut interpretive signage co-fabricated by Kathy Guo in the Design Thinking Initiative and Drew Palmer in the Hillier Woodshop with technical assistance from our arborists, Ben Green and Dave Dion. This opening lecture would not have happened without our manager of education, Sarah Loomis, and our technical assistant behind the scenes, Jeff Heath. Thank you both. I also want to thank and acknowledge President Kathleen McCartney, who recently announced she would be stepping down as Smith's 11th president in June of 2023. Just like our students, Kathy and Bill have called the Smith College campus, the entirety of which is a certified arboretum, their home for a decade. They've been staunch supporters and champions of our work throughout their residency. Thank you, Kathy and Bill. 
Finally, I want to introduce our education intern, Jamila De Piazza Kern, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Jamila is a senior anthropology major and a landscape studies minor. More than a student worker, we have leaned heavily on Jamila over the last four years as a scholar, contributor, and colleague. In an anthropology research methods course, she and her classmates helped to shape our thinking about ways to counter coloniality and redress colonial attitudes and practices at the Botanic Garden. She put experience gained as an intern with the American Public Gardens Association to work, helping the Botanic Garden of Smith College be recognized for our equity and inclusion initiatives through APGA's benchmarking program. A highlight of my time as director was appearing with Jamila on the Cultivating Place podcast where we explored these topics with author and host Jennifer Jewell. And in her current role, she's helping to lead and launch our new Botanic Garden Student Educators Program and serving on our department's equity and inclusion committee. Thank you, Jamila. Thank you so much, Tim, uh, for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Tim mentioned, my name is Jamila. And in addition to being a senior, I currently work as the education intern here at the Botanic Garden. And I'm lucky enough to have been involved with the Botanic Garden since my very first semester on campus. I started out as a work study student on the outdoor crew uh, where landscape curator, John Berryhill was my supervisor. And today it is my great pleasure to introduce John to you as this year's Bulb Show speaker. John is the landscape curator for the Botanic Garden of Smith College, where he has worked for more than 25 years. During his time here, he's been the wildflower gardener and spent more than a decade as chief arborist. Currently, John manages the outdoor horticulture team. It is also his responsibility to ensure that the outdoor plant collections at Smith are rooted in and reflective of the Botanic Garden's collections policy, strategic plan, and mission statement. In the past two years, he has led the effort to craft the garden's new collections management plan, which aims to incorporate the values of the garden's various communities, as well as to provide access to the critical work that today's botanic gardens are doing. This mission is closely aligned with John's graduate studies in the Smith College Department of Biological Sciences, where he has been focusing on the impact of climate change on small range trees and has been asking how botanic gardens can better serve as champions of plant conservation. I've had the opportunity to work with John in multiple capacities, both during the academic year and over the summer during the Botanic Gardens Summer Internship Program. Back in my first year when I was brand new to campus and looking for my first job, John was kind enough to offer me a position. I was more than happy to say yes, and I quite literally haven't left the Botanic Garden since. It has truly become my home away from home at Smith. I continued working on the outdoor crew for three years and could always count on having wonderful, insightful, and uplifting conversations with John. Over the years, John has also been incredibly supportive of my academic work. From interviewing him about decolonization to discussing the purpose of weeds on campus, I've always counted on him for his open and honest opinions. Today, John's talk will focus on many of these important questions that are facing botanic gardens in the 21st century. Please join us after the presentation for a Q&A session that will be moderated by Tim. So now I'll turn things over to John and I'm really looking forward to hearing his insights. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jamila, for the introduction and even more so thanks for being as Tim said, such an important part of the work that I'm going to be talking about today. Camila's worked with us in so many capacities and been such a big part of our team in the last couple of years. Happy early spring, everybody. I, it doesn't really feel like it so much today in Northampton, uh, at least, but I hope you've been getting glimpses of it wherever you're tuning in from. I'm really grateful to have this chance to share some of the exciting projects that my colleagues and I have been working on in the last couple of years. Uh, maybe two years or so. I'm usually in the audience for these flower show talks. Um, I've been going to them for maybe 20 years or more since way back when they were in Sealy Hall. And I've learned a lot from them. And before I give you an overview of what I'm going to be talking about, I really want to make that clear that we, the Botanic Garden staff, 
come to these flower show talks as learners too. And lately we've been really focused on bringing in talks that are not just interesting, but are important to us and can help us craft our priorities. So I hope that what I'm sharing this afternoon will kind of give you a, a glimpse of our thought process and how we turn these learning opportunities into collections building priorities and projects. There we go. Uh, what I'm gonna be focusing on is collections building here at Smith. We tasked ourselves with building a new collections management plan where we align curation with the needs of our learners. And in that process, we had to explore a lot of space. And what I want to do is take you on a little tour of what that process was like for us and how the, the purpose of Botanic Gardens have changed over the years and what's guiding our work today. And um, also just to see how we've turned those aspir aspirational ideas into the work that really feels right for us. In short, it's gonna be kind of a glimpse of us asking ourselves, why do we do this? Before I even get going, I wanna take you on a little glimpse of, um, or I wanna jog your memory, or if you didn't see them to uh, invite you to go to our YouTube channel to see how, um, to see recordings of recent talks that we've had that have, um, that have informed our priorities and in, 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 informed our thinking on this subject. We've um, had Duran Chavis come in to ask us to explore the social context of the, the, that our work is happening in, to see those clear lines between the past um, of, between harmful past practices and inequity today and to had Eric Tonsmeyer come in and look at how um, climate change, how even the smallest choices that we make have a real impact on climate change and how um, they can collectively have in, a big impact on sustainability. And last spring's uh, bulb show, um, Desiree Narango came in to show us explore those essential connections between our planted landscapes and the essential connections that they occur within. And lastly, for the mum show last fall, Dr. Sarada Sarada Krishnan came in to show us the, a scientist's perspective on the, how a, um, excuse me, how the, um, she called for a, on how species like coffee, well, give us a scientist perspective on the, uh, uh, culture, a culturally and economically important crop. And if you saw that talk, you may have caught how towards the end, uh, she called for a new kind of conservation collection for species like coffee that can't be seed banked. I'm gonna be referring back to these later in the talk and I hope you'll see how they resonate with the work that we're doing to, today. I should mention, uh, I'm going to be referring to a lot of resources like these four talks and that are really exciting and are accessible to our team, um, are accessible on the internet. I made a list of links like this that are going to be shared out with everyone who's registered for this talk through our e-newsletter and please, don't feel like you need to write them down if we're flying through them at, at warp speed or anything. I'll start with a quick overview of what botanic guard of how botanic gardens have evolved. But before I compress literally hundreds of years of rich and complex history into about five minutes, let's define what a botanic garden is. Uh, I know that most of us have a kind of a sense of what one is, and they certainly do come in all shapes and sizes and flavors, but a lot of people might struggle to clearly define what separates them from say a public park or a private garden. Um, I don't know if I could have explained that clearly when I was hired 20 years, 25 years ago, uh, thank God they didn't ask in the job interview. Um, but I tend to gravitate towards this one that I learned in the horticulture class here and that is used by Botanic Garden Conservation International that 
a botanic garden is a, an institution with documented living collections, plant collections, held for the purpose of scientific research, conservation, display, and education. Now, the path to that type of institution came through the physic gardens of medieval European monasteries. The purpose of those collections was the systematic study and the systematic study of medicinal plants. They were guided and really inspired by the most lasting and impactful published work on botanical pharmacology ever, really, which was De Materia Medica, uh, written by Dioscorides, who was a physician in the Greek army. I'm sorry, a Greek physician in the Roman army. It was written about 2,000 years ago and was regarded throughout Europe and the Middle East as the authoritative text on the subject of uh, botanical pharmacology for about 1,500 years or so. That's a pretty darn impressive run on the top of the bestsellers list. And it was broadly cir circulated in Arabic and Latin and Greek and became the basis for later works that supplanted it. The 16th century saw what was regarded as the first true botanic gardens, at least as I described them a moment ago. And perhaps it won't surprise you that many of them were learning resources for colleges and universities. But this was a time when the age of global empires and um, was starting to mature in Europe. And in an age when all, botan all economies were essentially primarily botanical economies of one sort or another, it was quickly understood that botanic gardens could be used to leverage economic inequality and to steal and exploit what today would be called intellectual property from indigenous uh, people around the world. If you look into the history of plants like tea and rubber, the rubber tree, hevia, and conchona, the plant that gives us quinine, you'll see some truly ugly examples of that. And they really had lasting effects on where power and money and harm were and still are concentrated in the world today. In the next two centuries, we saw a, the rapid maturing of botany as a science. This was characterized by things like uh, the publication of Carl Linnaeus's Systema Naturae, which gave us the Latin binomial nomenclature system that we still use today for classifying the natural world. It's why to scientists, you and I are homo sapien and homo sapiens and the sugar maple in your backyard is Acer sacrum. And this reverence at the time for botany and for the power of botanical knowledge led to the building of larger and more diverse botanical collections, which regardless of whether they were viewed primarily as reference collections for science or for uh, economic tools or as a metaphor for the extent of imperial rule, we have to look back at this time and at figures like Linnaeus, who we were never taught in school, worked extensively to use science to try to explain and therefore justify racial inequity. And this must compel us to recognize the dangerous naivety of the idea that scientific inquiry is just a neutral and unbiased observation of the workings of nature, that it only reflects what is out there and what not what is in our minds. A UMass scholar, Dr. Banu Subramanian, gave a great talk to the New England Botanical Society maybe about a year ago on her research and exploration of how the questions and the priorities of science are very much rooted on a cultural platform and being blind to that will lead to inequity and to exclusion. And again, we should remind ourselves of John Duran Chavis's words of warning against the ignorance of a that was then and this is now perspective and ignoring those inerasable lines between the two. Those three men on the right there, um, Raider, Wilson, and Sargent, earned a great deal of fame towards the end of this period and into the 20th century uh, for collections building and botanical exploration, exploration. And it is their names and the names of their peers that will be honored and celebrated 
when we speak of a number of plants, like Sargent's cherry, one of my favorite trees in the spring, Prunus sargentii is the scientific world's name for this plant, despite the fact that both its natural and its cultural history are tied to East Asia. And it's toward the end of this period that the Botanic Garden at Smith is founded and there starts to be a diversification of what a botanic garden can be and who and what it can serve. And Smith is really a great example of that, not only in that it started to make the world of botany and science accessible to women, but our integrated model of having a botanic garden, botanic garden collections that are curated for scientific study, completely woven into a campus landscape, got its start here at Smith. And it seems like such a natural fit for a liberal arts institution. And it's been replicated many times since the model prior to that was to have a botanic garden as a compartmentalized facility. And in the, in the time that we've been operating, the weight of the environmental crisis really starts to be felt. The 20th century is kind of dotted with these landmark events acknowledging loss and harm. There were alarm bells like the publication of Silent Spring and the initial publishing of the species threat assessments like the Red List from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And we saw botanical institutions like Native Plant Trust just down the road from us, down the Turnpike in Framingham emerge as the country's first institution focused on native plant conservation. A different name at the, at the time, but the same institution. And they really built a new model for what a botanic garden could be, one that was for the plants as opposed to for the plant collector. And as we saw some of these large institutions that had very much been part of the old model coming together to form these collaborative systems for conservation like Botanic Garden Conservation International, and the Center for Plant Conservation and so many more. And this was all part of a growing awareness that plants not only account for a huge amount of the biodiversity on earth, they're literally the foundation that all non-botanical diversity is built on, including our own human lives. And this culminated in a really significant pivot point in the creation of the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, which was adopted by the parties to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity in 2002. This strategy is aimed at the documentation, conservation, and sustainable and equitable use of the world's botanical resources, as well as education and capacity building to achieve that. It was the first broadly recognized framework for plant conservation objectives and measurable targets. And botanic gardens were not only a driving force behind it, uh, behind the creation of the strategy, they were given a new critical purpose by it. And a few years after its publication in 2006, a consortium of North American botanic gardens or botanical institutions, I should say, built a detailed roadmap for the botanic gardens on this continent to align their work with the objectives of the global strategy. And they converted the 16 targets of the global strategy into 65 salient measurable priorities in the North American Botanic Garden Strategy for plant conservation. It's a lot of long words and acronyms in the world of plant conservation. And I could spend the whole talk just talking about these two plans uh, but I will share the link, you'll get the link um, through, through our electronic newsletter, and I, I beg you just to at least skim through them. They're written to be accessible and relevant, they're compelling, they may make you see your own gardening in a different light and pull your curiosity in new directions. If you do, you'll see this really great uh, example on page 35 of the North American strategy, how Denver Botanic Garden, who's doing fantastic work, has used the global strategy to both, both as a compass and a yardstick to shape and measure their goals and projects. And I want to share one of my favorite stories that occurred just before these two strategies came out that I think characterized this new mission and, and paradigm shift 
This is Mount Washington in the presidential peaks of New Hampshire, one of my favorite places. And in the 1980s, there was less than an acre, I think significantly less than an acre, uh, just on the other side of that ridge you see in the distance. And it was home to what was left of the wild population of robin sink oil. If you're not familiar with it, that little plant is about the size of a half dollar, inch or two across. Not the flowers, but the whole darn plant. It's just such a neat little plant, the epitome of the undersized charismatic alpine plant. And in the 1990s, Native Plant Trust, as part of a multi-agency effort, were able to determine how to propagate and reestablish an ecologically viable population of it in this area, which resulted in robin sinkfoil being the first plant ever to be removed from the federal endangered species list. Plant collecting in this area for gardens and for herbaria was a primary cause of this plant extinction crisis and rethinking the purpose of plant collections and botanic garden work was an essential part of reversing it. And all this leads us to the point where we found ourselves about two years ago asking, what is the most important work that our collections can do? The question is about curation, but simply asking ourselves, how do we add the most stuff to our collections or the rarest stuff or even the most diverse stuff essentially ignores questions about what is important to the Smith community and what's the important work that our professional community is doing. Again, Duran's message, what is the context that our work is happening? And how do we turn these aspirational ideas in, and values into the, the ones that are expressed in our mission statement into meaningful action steps? and avoid an idea that I learned from Jamila and her peers in Colin Hoag's anthropology class when they examined our work in the context of the colonial, hist colonial history of botanic gardens. And they cautioned us against tokenism. That's a word that I had not deeply contemplated with respect to botanical collections and certainly have since. So as we're deciding the right path here, we really have to acknowledge Excuse, sorry. We really have to acknowledge the two fundamental aspects of our identity. We are Smith College and we are a botanic garden. And fortunately, those two worlds have put a tremendous amount of work recently into defining their essential priorities. In 2019, many of you probably know we crafted a five year strategic plan that was nested within the, the college's five year strategic plan and priorities that were identified by our community. And between those two strategic plans and our mission statement and collections policy, we have a really clear set of priorities to work with that are centered on allowing Smith students to bring their voices to complex urgent problems. And on the Botanic Garden side, we have the global strategy and the North American strategy that have really outlined some of the world's most complex and most urgent problems and have identified that we really need a diversity of voices to solve them. And it was really motivating to see the amount of synergy that emerged as we explore that space. And to put that synergy into a little sharper focus, we see, oops, sorry, we see a call to understand the connections between environmental and social justice to really understand that elevating one part of a living system or a social system above the rest causes harm and to invite everyone to have an equal voice in pursuing solutions. It means building active working collections. That's a new term that we borrowed from the museum world. And to me, at least, it means no longer building collections and then asking ourselves, what work do we want to do with them? It means first asking ourselves, what work do we want to do? And how do we build collections that do that work? We're not stamp collecting, simply having something in our collections is not the goal. It means moving from an old competitive model of ownership, where you view your collections as being primarily populated with collectibles, 
towards a collaborative model of stewardship where collections are built for the sake of, in our case, the plants and the natural and cultural histories that they're tied to. It took over a year of work to translate those philosophies and mission, mission level thinking that I just described into the collection of projects that really felt right for our community. Ones that as Desiree Narango so, explored so beautifully in her talk, respect the connection between our collections and both the living systems that they represent and the ones that, that Smith is situated within, ones that took advantage of being at a liberal arts institution to examine the historic and cultural context that Botanic Gardens are operating in, ones that connect our collections to teaching and research at Smith. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Robin Wall Kimmerer, She's a scholar at SUNY and a member of the Potawatomi Nation and more famous as an author on several popular books on the intersections of science and indigenous knowledge and frequently speaks of the concept of reciprocity with the botanical world and the larger biological world as being central to so many indigenous cultures. And we knew that that had to be a central aim of this plan. I'm not gonna take you through all 28 action items, but I do want to share a few examples and overviews with you that will hopefully give you a glimpse of it and maybe serve as an invitation to explore the whole document that you'll be getting a link to. One of our most exciting ones uh, is that we've created a plant conservation internship focused on a number of projects, many of them involving partnerships at the regional, or national or even international level with some real heavy hitters in plant conservation. One I really enjoyed this summer was bringing our first ever conservation intern, Mackenzie Swart, who became another great part of our team here into Native Plant Trust's Plant Conservation Volunteer Program. Perhaps some of you have heard of it or maybe even participate yourselves but it creates a trained volunteer corps to go out into the New England landscape and to track rare native plant occurrences and to produce the data that ultimately guides conservation action and resource allocation and even policy. Uh, and now it can guide our conservation collection building priorities and storytelling opportunities here at Smith as well. Another is joining up with the Global Conservation Consortium Oak and Magnolia. These are brand new programs started by Botanic Garden Conservation International to network the resources of botanical gardens around the world to build carefully coordinated living collections that will safeguard the genetic diversity of species that, like Sharada Krishnan mentioned for coffee, cannot be held in seed banks because their seeds won't remain viable through the freezing and drying process. They've identified several uh, genera like oak and magnolia that fit that category and that also have many small range endemic species that put them at a higher risk for extinction. They will be held collaboratively uh, by multiple institutions. This is being called a meta collection and when I say carefully coordinated, I'm talking about the fact that the genetic diversity that any of any species essentially contains the adaptive tools that create resilience. And it can take hundreds of individuals collected from throughout the geographic range and the ecological dimensions of that species to really capture that diversity. And it takes a lot of work to determine what pieces of the puzzle are currently being held in collections, where they're being held, where they come from, what parts are missing, and where future work needs to be prioritized, as well as how to best leverage the complementary strengths of various institutions. We've been working with Professor Jesse Bellamere to, at Smith to deter, help determine priorities for the Magnolia effort in the Eastern United States. And our first specimens uh, for these collections are gonna be coming in this year and will be mostly held at the McLeish Field Station, hopefully for centuries, 
where they may end up playing a role in the ultimate fate of those species. Our second priority is closely related to a large portion of our strategic plan and among other things has led us to look at the meaningful partnerships that connect the resources of botanic gardens with the needs of local indigenous communities. There's been a lot of focus lately on indigenous food sovereignty and seed rematriation. We found examples of this popping up recently and I'll share one example that is happening in Craftsbury, Vermont, one, another one of my favorite places where Sterling College is, has partnered with the local Ab Abenaki people there to commit land and time and resources to the re rematriation and preservation of indig indigenous seed varieties there. Its success really lying in that it is being, it is being done both with and for the Abenaki people there. We saw a lot of opportunities for growth in collections building with current or connecting collections building with current research and teaching here. I want to share two really exciting uh, connections that we were able to make just in the last eight months or so. One of Smith's newest professors is Dr. Mariana Abarca, whose research is tied into the world of entomology and botany and ecology and how both uh, are focused for the moment on the threatened Baltimore checker spot butterfly and how both climate change and changing food source and availability are converging to create a crisis for this species. If you have a chance to see Dr. Mariana talk about this research, do it. it it's um, interesting, it is uh, important and it will speak to the gardener and the, the naturalist in you for, for sure. Uh, we are now using Cape and Garden to grow the plants that will literally be the food for that research, which gives us a really great interpretation opportunity to connect people with a really compelling story. And it also involved us at the end of the summer, essentially curating a little patch of garden weeds down near the end of the garden, English plantain to be specific. Uh, and as Smith is looking for ways to reduce harmful chemical inputs in our landscape, hearing that we needed lawn weeds for research was, was just awesome. Likewise, in Capon, we were lucky enough to connect with Dr. Piyush Lapsifwar, who had been working with the Land Institute in Kansas on developing perennial grains. If you know anything about the impact that plowing up the annual crops that provide most of the world's food has on the future health and viability of soils. You'll understand what I felt hearing Piyush talk about the impact that converting these to perennial crops through crossbreeding would have. It would be really hard to overstate the impact that success here could have on the sustainability of the planet and on the lives of farmers. I'm really excited to have some of these plants in Capon uh, starting this year and look forward to, to work, working with Piyush to ensure that our community has access to this story of, of hope, really. We've identified steps to make sure that our plantings and collections are developed in a way that minimizes chemical and water and carbon inputs and to make sure our staff have access to the latest practices and thinking pertaining to that and that they're free to experiment with new ideas. And lastly, it felt hypocritical not to think as broadly as we could about sustainability with Eric Konsmeyer's message in mind. We identified as many areas as we could to look at how our operations impact the, the biological world. They range from energy and resource saving measures in our offices to moving from gas to electric powered vehicles and equipment. A quick tip, if anybody is a chainsaw owner out there, you can use canola oil instead of petroleum bar and chain oil. When you're, when you're running that saw, uh, that oil is, is spilled out or sprayed, I should say, out in, into the environment and into the, momentarily into the air you're breathing and it's cheaper. Um, so that was a great, um, great one for us. When I began this work two years ago, 
I looked to the North American strategy, just as Denver had with the global strategy, to use it as a lens to assess our work. And I feel that we could honestly say that our work was aimed at about 15% of the relevant targets on that list. With all 28 of the action items on this plan up and running, I feel we can honestly say that our work is aimed at about 95% of the relevant targets. And that feels really good. And speaking of really good, before I start to, to wrap this up, I have to jump off to something completely different for a sec and extend another invitation. I'm sure that a lot of you are going to see the bulb show and to bask in all the wonderful color and scents there, but I want to get you excited that there are a million little things happening that you never knew about that can lift you up just as high as the bulb show can. If you're a student in Gabby Immerman's class, you're about to start, or maybe you already have, uh, an exercise that was probably the most impactful educational project that I've ever done in my life, which was to closely observe and record the details of buds opening as the spring progresses. I did it in the horticulture class here about 20 years ago, and I could not believe what had been hiding in plain sight my whole life. And I've been doing it informally ever since. The, the art of looking closely at plants as they change gets so addictive and it, it can change your life. I guarantee it. Every year I see something new that I can't believe I've been missing. Last year, one of those moments came on a trail run when I came across that plant in the upper left-hand corner there uh, that had just leaved out with these beautiful scarlet leaves. So you can see it's just about to flower with the buds there. And it was just so gorgeous how I was catching the morning, morning light with that color. If you haven't placed it yet, that's my old friend, poison ivy, a, a plant that I've had a troubled past with, to say the least. Um, but this moment gave me a chance to see it with new eyes and to really take some joy in a moment of beauty where I just never would have expected to find it. And that's my wish for you, that you have many moments like that. So please, please let the bulb show be a reminder to slow down and to start looking closely every spring and to see things with new eyes and to take joy in that. And with that, I'll pause and, and take questions that you have. And thank you for your, your time and your interest in the subject. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John, for that amazing talk. The Q&A is open if people would like to um, enter any questions, we'll get to as many as we can. And then those that we're able to will follow up with uh, through social media as well. Um, John, here's one question. Can you tell us a little bit about planting for climate change? How do you think about the resilience of our campus um, as you look to the next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Uh, it's a real challenging one that there's, the, Predictions are, are hard to make. Uh, there's a prediction that we're going to get warmer, of course. There's also a prediction that things could get a little bit wetter here, but that it could be a net loss, actually, because the warmth actually reduces available moisture in the soil. And also, um, some people are advocating for planting with more southerly, and sometimes they sort of simplify predictions by assuming that, let's say, in the short term, we'll get a Pennsylvania climate in the long term, we maybe will have a Virginia or a or North Carolina climate. But the truth is, it's probably going to be very erratic. And predicting how to plant for that is, is hard to do. And there's a, another, so rather than just planting warmer climate species, some people are advocating for planting what has more plants that have demonstrated more plasticity. And what's meant by that is species like red maple, for example, that you can find if you go into southern Canada, and I was just in Florida and I saw it down there. These species that have already demonstrated in a very short time after the last ice age, 11,000 years, this ability to adapt into a really broad range of climate conditions and that they have that resilience already in them. So 
for plants that are landscape plants that we want to be long-lived species, that plasticity is maybe a focus for those plants. However, for the conservation purpose, we sort of have to be looking at care for those really vulnerable species. So as a botanic garden, we have to sort of have our eyes that the, the Olmsteadian landscape, half of what we do is maybe looking at plasticity and the conservation modern science aspect of us is maybe looking at vulnerability and where our resources can be applied to that. There are a um, number of accolades coming in through the Q&A, just so you know, so people are finding ways to clap, even though we <laughs> I apologize for the hiccup at the start to my notes screen, which I have on my laptop froze and I had to close and reopen my uh, screen. So I apologize if I, I slowed down and-, and uh... No, I don't know that anyone noticed. Um, <laughs> here's another question, John, which is what can regular gardeners do to participate in practices that support farming equity issues? Oh, that's a, that's a, a fantastic question. Fortunately, I, I think, I, I would like to think that, that Botanic Gardens will get better and better at getting, giving our community members access to that and those conversations are happening. What I'm embarrassed to say is that those conversations are extremely new and that the, although there are great examples that I've, I've seen Denver Botanic Garden, uh, for example, just bringing, uh, underserved community members of their community in to, to celebrate their culture and so on in there. There's, there's a lot of work that's happening, but how to, to do that? I think I'm hoping that we can find examples. And I, and I want to be careful about saying, you know, I, I listed the, the Dawnland Garden at, at Sterling College. That's a great small scale example. And I, I don't know if that's something that necessarily individuals can get involved with, but I suspect they can. Uh, there, there may be ways to support preserving cultural seed lines. I'll, I'll, as part of the link, I'll, I'll actually, I need to add one, that the North Native American Food Sovereignty, Sovereignty Alliance gives a great glimpse into the work that's being done there and how gardeners can support that. That's something that you actually can get involved in. That's something you can donate to. When you see gardens that are aimed at underserved community, whether that's food producing gardens and food deserts or just beautification gardens to bring in what Smith alum, Wendon Miller calls the life affirming qualities of gardens, something that I think we all believe in and, and believe should be equally accessible. Um, that it might not be the work that's happening in your backyard, but, but literally giving your time and your money to those projects is probably the most effective thing that you can do right now. And you can tell Botanic Gardens that that's the work that matters to you. John, we've got a great question here, which I think might connect to your work uh, with Magnolia. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that project and connect it to this question about um, the ethics of assisted migration of plants or concerns that might arise about um, assisted migration. Sure. The, well, I'll, I'll start by defining as assisted migration is sort of, um, a, a, I think, a relatively new uh, conversation relative maybe a couple of few decades old, Jesse de Bellmare could, could give a, a, a more detailed answer than I could, but it's the idea that climate change is occurring and it's happening faster than uh, species can adapt to it by the natural processes that allow species to migrate through plasticity, through genetic adaptation, and through natural migration. And climate change appears to be happening at an unprecedented rate right now, which means that species that wouldn't be lost under, I use air quotes here, normal conditions might be lost and that we can provide an ecological service by moving them to places that if the process were happening slower, those process would, processes would occur naturally. The argument against that is that we're just tinkering with natural processes and we have the potential to introduce invasive species and create um, species assemblages that are novel and just wouldn't happen naturally. 
there's probably other arguments against it, but those are, are sort of the primary ones. And uh, I tend to, I, I think that those that argue against it don't understand, uh, are perhaps failing to see that one, the, I, the concept of a, a, a natural state is, is a false one, that even without the human hand in there, that things are happening, turning over so much faster than you'd think. It's not just that, that if we all, if humans suddenly disappeared, that the right assemblage of plants would, would somehow naturally occur, even if we hadn't moved the invasive species and others around. And so to, to well, I'll finish that thought before talking about the magnolia. Uh, we're going to lose species, I guess the, the short answer. There's a very long explanation, uh, a whole talk on that, but we're going to lose species if we can't find ways to, in situ, which means in their natural environment, find homes and facilitate the natural processes that would occur if climate change were happening slower. My uh, research with, with Jesse that I mentioned in the talk and we were talking about there, and also I'll have a more detailed in our leaflet, uh, members will get our annual magazine publication leaflet where I'll have an article describing my graduate studies with the that are aimed at the Global Conservation Consortium for Magnolia, where Jesse and I found really strong evidence that in the heart of Mountain Magnolia's range, that's a Southern Appalachian small range endemic that occurs on the mid slopes of, of those mountains down there. So strong evidence that it is trying to move up slope in response to climate change and that the climate is probably moving faster than it can and that it's going to be pushed towards mountaintops where you'll have genetic bottlenecks and maybe even eventually talking hundreds of years down the road it'll it'll get pushed off the top of the mountain it's called the escalator effect or escalator to extinction is now the new term for it and there's no natural process for it to hop to mountaintops higher up and part of that research was inventorying the co-occurring species to, to make sure that mountain magnolia didn't have a suppressive effect on biological diversity there and that it coexisted with species like hobble bush and yellow uh, birch and white pine and oaks and the, the inhabitants that like Jesse and I were constantly or at least I was constantly remarking to Jesse is like we could be just walking through Vermont right here with a few exceptions of course there a big, a big, I went in a couple of directions there, but that's a really big topic and, and one that's going to be an ongoing conversation in, in horticulture and in ecology. Um, John, it, this is a good question. How do you address naming issues, inappropriate names, zero centered names, especially with uh, ones that have been around for centuries? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's actually one that, one of the few that we really called out in the priority two that addresses um, racist and colonial leg legacies in botanic garden work. That we will examine our names, our interpretive material, and our accompanying information for language that is racist or bigoted or offensive, and if we can't get rid of it, we will. Um, reconsider how that is presented in the, the, the information that, that comes along with that. It's part of a, the, the entire Botanic Garden community is doing that. There's actually a, a recently a, just a big resource that opened up through the American Public Garden Association aimed specifically at that. And there's a lot of learning that has to go along with that. There, there are names that if you don't know the story behind it, unfortunately, a lot of this language just becomes normal to us, we hear a name or a word and we don't realize that it has a really problematic past. And I think a liberal arts institution, I think that's a, a strength of Smith, we're, we're an ideal place to really dig in on that point and to do a better job than it's been done in the past. I think that's a good transition to our next question, um, noting that some of the challenges botanic gardens are facing, we need help from other disciplines. Um, how is the Botanic Garden engaging with departments outside of the sciences in guiding the development of the collections? Um, we did that with the strategic plan, certainly. Um, I, as I referenced in there, a big part of it was um, Jam Jamila's work with, with Colin Hoag's anthropology class was fed into the collections management plan here. 
we have to, we've been doing a lot of connections through seeds. Uh, that was another, if you read the full um, introduction to the collections management plan, you'll see a lot of the frameworks that I just, I just kind of connected the major dots there, but the introduction, there's a couple pages that'll go into more detail than I did in this talk on how the um, uh, seeds department at Smith uh, has outlined sustainability goals for the college. And that was very much something that had to be reflected in our collection, collections building and our collections care and our general operations here. I know also that you uh, are often working with classes on the use of a collection, so not necessarily the development of collections, but if you can speak to that for a second, some of the class projects that have utilized the collections or, um, or different, different courses that like the, the range of courses that you're interacting with the curriculum. Sure, just, just in the past year, we were able to connect with it well, uh, quite a bit on uh, the art department through the Amanda Williams tulip planting that's gonna be coming up. I was able to um, connect with um, Danielle, I, I'm hoping I remember her last name, Carabino uh, for a J-term class on wood uh, and wood, wood used in art and was able to sort of bring the the biological piece of that, because a lot of people had just sort of experienced wood as a product and not as a living thing. And that was a nice collaboration to make. I'm going to be going back to Chris Aiken's dance class again to talk about some interesting uh, points and, and uh, issues that are at the, at the front of our minds as we're caring for and building the collections. Uh, everything from just as, as prompts for uh, thought that goes into dance choreography that might be hidden to just the casual observer. For example, everything from the changing relationship with collections uh, ownership and stewardship, the, the, the code of transition of botanic art history that I described, the Smith uh, model where we have the Olmstedian landscape that is that asks the viewer to step back and to take where all the, the details are subordinate to the whole and to step back and really appreciate and take in the big picture and how that's sort of a con contrasting energy with scientific inquiry, which really asks the observer to step in and to notice the most minute aspects of a plant's identity or character. And those appear to be contrasting energies, but really play nicely with each other and are an interesting thought, the challenge of keeping plants alive even, uh, Smith, specifically the trees. Uh, it's really nice to have an arboretum integrated into a living urban-ish landscape, but uh, it's very hard to grow big old trees here and the work and, and hidden world underneath the ground that requires in some cases more care than the above ground part of the tree and a lot of people don't see that and it's, um, things to contemplate that can uh, they can work even for the dance world. It's hard to believe, but it has already been an hour. I want to thank you once again, John, for an incredible, incredible talk. Thank you so much for, for sharing your work. Um, a reminder to those who we didn't answer your questions, we have a number of wonderful questions that we will uh, have John reply to through social media, and we'll, we'll try to email those out as well. A lot of inspiring questions about how people can get involved, which is really exciting. And then a reminder to everyone that this is recorded and we will be releasing this video as well. And so you'll be able to view it again or share it with anyone who missed uh, the, tonight's talk. Um, thank you once again. We're so uh, grateful to have you here tonight. Good night and be safe. Good night, everyone.